The Story of the Lion In Africa, television is not the main object of entertainment. Stories are told as lessons to learn of the past. One of the most famous stories is the story of the lion. Every night before bed, the father would tell his son of the wonderful strength and power of the lion, how the lion was the king of his domain and could not be defeated. The young boy was captivated by the strength and character of the lion and always held to this animal in high esteem. Because of these stories, the son developed strength, courage, and kindness. Later in life, the young boy left his country and moved away. Upon entering school, he began to hear more stories of the lion. But these stories were different. The lion was no longer strong and proud. In fact, the lion was defeated by the weakest of animals. The young boy went to his teacher in a state of confusion and said, Teacher, why are these stories different from the stories in Africa? The teacher said, That's the way life is. The young boy was still confused. Upon returning to Africa, the son immediately approached his father. Father, you told me that the lion was strong and unbeatable, but when I went to school in America, it was said that the lion was weak and easily defeated. Father, how can that be? His father said, son, don't be confused. The reason why the lion is portrayed this way is because the lion does not know how to write stories. Until the lion learned how to write his own story, he will always be portrayed otherwise. According to its inhabitants, gold came from the south, the salt from the north, and the divine knowledge came from this majestic city. Over time, its unique geographical position enabled it to become the natural meeting point for many significant peoples of Africa, namely the Mandinga, Songhai, Wangara, Fulani, and the Tore. The city owes its name to an African woman who was the trusted keeper of the waterway and merchandise that the travelers would leave from one season to another, which resulted in the establishment of a successful trade route. The woman's name was Teen Abutu, and the city became Timbuktu. It is to this privileged position that Timbuktu owes much of its historical dynamism. Tombouctou, c'est la capitale des manuscrits. Non seulement au 15e ou 16e siècle, mais même dans la première moitié du 20e siècle. From the 9th century onward, Timbuktu emerged as an important trade center where goods from West Africa and other parts of Africa were traded. Timbuktu's prosperity attracted people of all backgrounds, both African scholars and merchants. When trade was thriving in Timbuktu, the goods most demanded were gold, salt, and books. And the books were the refined works of the native scholars.
The Emperor of Mali, Mansa Musa, also known as Kanka Musa, was so taken with the thriving economy of Timbuktu. He was not only attracted to its prosperity, but was so impressed with this deep African Islamic tradition and the highly advanced intellectual contributions that he captured the city. Upon capturing the city in 1324, Mansa Musa set out on a pilgrimage to Mecca. When he returned, accompanying him was one of the greatest architects of the time, an Egyptian named Abu Ishaq as Sahili. Sahili was paid 200 kilograms of gold to build the Chingarabir University, also known as the Grand Mosque. In addition, Mansa Musa also built a royal palace for himself another mosque in Jene, and a great mosque in Gao, all within one year. Mansa Musa's effort to beautify the architecture of Timbuktu was part of a great plan to make the city a place flourishing with both wealth and knowledge. So he brought scholars from all over Africa to teach, as well as other parts of the world. To his great surprise, the emperor quickly discovered that some of the scholars he had brought over lacked the level of scholarship that he was hoping for. In fact, when compared to the native black scholars already present in Timbuktu, he found that their knowledge and mastery of the sciences paled in comparison. Mansa Musa's pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324 had made Mali known worldwide. The great ruler took 60,000 people with him, 15,000 camels and horses, each pulling 300 pounds of gold. Every city in which he stopped, Mansa Musa gave gold in charity to the people. During Mansa Musa's visit to Cairo, he was often asked how he became the emperor of Mali. Musa explained that his uncle and predecessor, Abu Bakr II, was a passionate explorer. In 1307, Abu Bakr II decided to set sail in search of a sea route to Mecca and to discover for himself the mysteries of the ocean. When Abu Bakr and his maritime expedition left the shores of Senegal, they sailed straight into the Atlantic Ocean. It was reported that they encountered so many difficulties and challenges that he had to return to Senegal. Soon after, Abu Bakr reorganized his expedition, collected enough provisions, and gathered a large army to accompany him. This time, Abu Bakr, along with 1,000 ships filled with learned men, explorers, and soldiers, sailed through the Atlantic Ocean, but never to return. So Mansa Musa became the natural successor. Today, there is strong historical evidence that Abu Bakr II was the first one to set sail to the Americas about 200 years before Christopher Columbus. By the 12th century, there were 25,000 students attending the University of Timbuktu. The city had 100,000 residents, so approximately one-fourth of the population were students. For years, people traveled to Timbuktu from every corner of the African continent and many parts of the world in pursuit of knowledge and trade. <laughs> والعمل الثاني الذي قام به هو بناء هذه المدرسة لتعليم أبناء البلد. The University of Timbuktu was organized around three great universities: University of Sankori, Jingarabir, and City Yahya. Jingarabir University was built nearly 700 years ago under the rule of Mansa Musa in 1325. It became the city's central mosque. Every Friday, nearly 10,000 people prayed at the Jingarabir University. The Sankor University, which lies in the northeastern part of Timbuktu, was first built by the Mandinka people around the 12th century. A Wangara or Mandinka woman financed Sankor University, making it the leading center of learning in Africa at the time. The University of Timbuktu had four degrees or levels in its curriculum. The primary degree. At this level, the students learned and mastered volumes of books of sciences 
including the Holy Quran. Learn the Arabic language and learn to communicate and write effectively in various African languages. The secondary degree. At this level, the students are introduced to the different branches of knowledge. Grammar, jurisprudence, mathematics, geography, history, physics, astronomy, chemistry, and the science of the purification of the heart, soul, and mind. The students also spend time learning a trade. University trade shops offer classes in business, carpentry, farming, fishing, construction, shoemaking, tailoring, navigation, and much more. The superior degree. The curriculum was highly specialized. The students would study under the guidance of a professor. It involved advanced research and extensive writing. Graduation was based upon a student's excellent moral character and his mastery of the sacred knowledge. The Circle of Knowledge This was the elite group of imams, scholars, and professors. It was here that the most important and crucial issues of the empires and the world were discussed and debated. Leaders of the time, such as Aski Muhammad of the Songhai Empire, Mansa Musa of the Malian Empire, Sheikh Ahmadu of the Fulani Caliphate of Masina, the Emirs, and the Sultans of the provinces of the Sudan, sent crucial questions to the scholars of Timbuktu. <laughs> Scholars who receive questions would make copies then distribute them among the members of the circle of knowledge. Each scholar would individually research the issue. When they were all done, they would gather together and share their answers which would later be published in manuscripts. The manuscripts described in great detail the questions or issues and then the responses were given by the scholars. The Timbuktu manuscripts are the greatest find since the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Timbuktu manuscripts are a symbolic representation of the impact and influence of the early schools and universities that existed in West Africa. Everyone who truly cares and appreciate the effort to preserve an African legacy. <laughs> An academic legacy. And a spiritual legacy are obliged to help save the endangered manuscripts of Timbuktu. There are 700,000 original manuscripts in Timbuktu and neighboring cities that are on the verge of being lost if the appropriate action is not taken. These manuscripts represent a turning point in the history of Africa and its people. It's called Dra al Khairat. Dra al Khairat has been written 700 years ago. 700 years ago. Incredible. Incredible. The translation and publication of the manuscripts of Timbuktu will restore self-respect, pride, honor, and dignity to the people of Africa and the descendants of Africa. It will also destroy the stereotypical images of Africa as primitive and underdeveloped. These manuscripts of Timbuktu are a living testimony of the highly advanced and refined civilization in Sub-Saharan Africa. Before the European Renaissance, Timbuktu flourished as the greatest academic and commercial center in Africa and the world. Great empires such as Ghana, Mali, and Songhai were proofs of the talents, creativity, and ingenuity of the African people. This is a hole that they have put on at the top of the roof so that you can see uh, you can see inside 
it's like a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a window for for the wind to get in and makes it cool makes the masjid very very cool this is how they have it at the top of the masjid hmm? they have these little holes and this is the ventilation system the ventilation that was created for generations for centuries before air conditioning came about the University of Timbuktu produced both black African scholars and leaders of the highest rank character and nobility the manuscripts of Timbuktu cover diverse subjects such as mathematics chemistry physics optics, astronomy, medicine, Islamic sciences, history, geography, the traditions of the prophets, government, legislation, and much more. Today, this entire African legacy is on the verge of being lost. The brittle conditions of the manuscripts, pages disintegrate easily like ashes, the termites, insects, weather, piracy of the manuscripts, and the selling of these treasures to tourists for food money. All of this pose a serious threat to the future of the manuscripts of Timbuktu. I think the Timbuktu Educational Foundation will play a great role in the renaissance of the African history. That's why the Malian government uh, is pleased to endorse this initiative and uh, we invite you also to participate to this great initiative. Thank you very much. I would like to introduce to you Iman, Iman W. Dean Muhammad. Timbuktu Educational Foundation is appointed and mandated by the government of Mali and the official authorities of the city of Timbuktu as agents and legal caretakers of the manuscripts of Timbuktu. This is indeed a very historic occasion and one that my spirit and soul welcomes with rejoicing. The manuscripts represent uh, probably the most significant opportunity in this century for humanity in general, but Africans in particular, to learn the truth of African civilization, African people's knowledge and contributions to world civilization. In the 1800s, there was a turning point in the history of Timbuktu. During colonization, thousands of manuscripts were burned and confiscated. However, scholars kept hidden original copies in their private libraries. Today, there are hundreds of thousands of original manuscripts still buried, but not forgotten in the sand of time. In the African world, our history has been most of the time distorted, and more particularly the history of education. And uh, with this uh, Timbuktu Educational Foundation, this is a time for us to recover what has been lost, but to do it in a very chronological way from the time immemorial to nowadays. Based on the 700,000 manuscripts that the foundation wants to restore, preserve, translate, and publish, each concerned individual sponsored one manuscript, we would secure the funds needed to allow the foundation to undertake its activities and programs, and thus, rewrite the history of Africa and its people. The, the Timbuktu Foundation, it seems to me, is uh, a critical step in this, this long, long trek that African people have been going through in order to find our way back to ourselves. Um, I think that uh, Africa's natural developmental trajectory was, was distorted or derailed or, um, in some senses, even aborted. And Timbuktu, particularly with its uh, with the holdings of those, uh, those ancient texts, is a good place to begin to go back and hear Africa's voice and then get us back on track. Because we have to, we have to understand who we are as African people and not these sort of mutations that have been the consequences of chattel slavery and, uh, and colonialism. 
The mission of the Timbuktu Educational Foundation is to resurrect to its rightful place the contributions of Timbuktu scholars in the annals of world history. The first phase of this project is to restore, preserve, translate, and publish the manuscripts of Timbuktu. Within the first phase, we will restore the historical buildings which house the University of Timbuktu. The second phase is to reopen the University of Timbuktu with its classical methods of teaching. ختاماً نسأل الله العلي الخدير أن يكلل مساعيكم وجهودكم بالنجاة والفوز المبين وأن ينصركم نصرا عزيزا ويفتح لنا ولكم. The third phase is the opening of a branch of the University of Timbuktu in the U.S. utilizing the same classical methods of teaching, and finally to promote tourism educational and cultural exchanges between the peoples of Africa, Americans, Europeans, and others. And this is where we are. We began to work on the, on, on the issue. Today we are here. Today we are, we are actually rewriting, or better said yet, today we are uh, restoring the history of, that we have lost. Because all along we have let, let people to write the history for us. We know that whenever a person, somebody else writes your history, he will not give you the correct history. And today, this is a memorable time. It's time for us to celebrate. I'm so excited because we are actually making history. The late African scholar, Waziri of Sokoto, Junaid Ibn Muhammad al-Bukhari once said, Whoever does not inform his child of his grandparents, then he has destroyed his child, mirrored his descendants, and injured his offspring the day he dies. Whoever does not make use of his ancestry, then he has muddled his reason. Whoever is not concerned with his descent, then he has lost his mind. Whoever neglects his origin, then his stupidity has become crucial. Whoever does not cause his ancestry to be abundant, then his incompetence has become great. Whoever does not increase his place of descent, then he has abolished his honor. <laughs>